Well, this video marks the beginning of a new book we're going to be studying in our New Testament. We're going to be studying the book of Hebrews in our Bible classes at the Monte Vista Church of Christ. On our schedule, we have the book of Hebrews next, and we're going to be studying that over the next few weeks. I want you to remember that we are trying to get these videos out uh, at least twice a week during our normal Bible class hours. So you'll have one video that will be coming out on Sunday mornings, and you have another video coming out on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. This video right here, we're going to deal with Hebrews chapter 1. And remember, I'm going to continue to provide outlines uh, for every single class that I'll be teaching for every chapter. Also, if you have questions you want to send to me, you can uh, send them to me at my email. For our members, you can send it to me at, at my email or you can give me a phone call and I'll be more than happy to do my best to, to answer your questions. I want to thank again our uh, one of our deacons, Brother Brian Sheely, for uh, helping me with this, for videoing this, taking the time to do that and help me get my materials out. Uh, I certainly could not do this without his help. Now, as far as the book of Hebrews goes, before we actually get into chapter 1, I think it is important that I spend a few moments just giving you some background information on the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is really a very interesting and unique book in the New Testament. In fact, it is the only book in the New Testament where we do not know 100% who the author is. We do not know who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. We do not know that because the author of the book does not identify himself. Now, there are many opinions about who wrote the book of Hebrews. For example, many religious uh, leaders in the second and, and third centuries had their opinions about it. Uh, Clement of Alexander, of Alexandria, Origen, Eusebius, Jerome, Augustine, all of these leading religious men attribute the book to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is the person that most a tribute to the book of Hebrews. And I don't think that is insufficient. I mean, there is a lot of evidence that suggests that the Apostle Paul could be the author. For example, when you study the book very carefully, you see that whoever wrote the book was a co-worker with Timothy. Well, we all know that Paul was a co-worker with Timothy. The author also seems to be writing from Rome and we also know that the Apostle Paul spent some time in Rome. He actually spent time in Rome as a, as a prisoner. The author of the book is also very familiar with the Jewish system. He is very familiar with the law of Moses. He's very familiar with the old covenant system. And, and the Apostle Paul would certainly fit that bill. The Apostle Paul was a leading a uh, religious leader under the Old Testament system. He was a Pharisee. He was someone who was very skilled in the old law. And so there is a lot of evidence to suggest that the Apostle Paul is the one who, who, who penned the words of this letter. But again, we don't know for certain. We don't know for certain who wrote the book of Hebrews because the author does not identify him himself. And I want to emphasize that, that that's really not of most importance. The most important thing about the author or the source of this book is not really who penned the words. Instead, it is understanding that this book was inspired by God. Like all of the other books of the New Testament, this book also came from the mind of God. It was also inspired by the Holy Spirit. In fact, the first century Christians, after much discussion, they agreed to that. They understood that this book was inspired by God like all the other New Testament books. And so the first thing we need to understand is, is, is we don't really know the person, who the person was who penned the words of the book. But, but secondly, we also need to understand some things about, about the recipients of this book. You see, the recipients of the book of Hebrews were, 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 were Jews, specifically Jewish Christians. Jews who had given up the Old Testament uh, 
system as far as living by that system in a religious sense and they had now given their lives to Jesus Christ. In fact, this is the only New Testament book that is primarily addressed to Jewish Christians. This book was written to Jewish or Hebrew Christians. In fact, the author seems to have known these Christians on a very personal level. These were people that he was friends with. These were people that he or she were acquainted with. The author seems to have known these Christians personally. And then thirdly, the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book of Hebrews seems to be to encourage the discouraged. It seems to have been to encourage these Jewish Christians to not abandon their faith in Jesus and go back to living under the Old Testament system. Again, many of these Christians had given up Judaism in order to obey the gospel, in order to become followers of Jesus. And when you study the book very carefully, it appears that, that these Christians were being persecuted. They were being persecuted and mocked for their new faith in Jesus, and they were actually considering abandoning Christianity, abandoning their faith in Jesus in order to go back to live under the Old Testament law of Moses. They were being persecuted severely, and the pressure of the persecution seems to have started to, to get to them. They were actually considering leaving Jesus to go back to living under the old law. And the point of this book is, is very simple. The author is trying to emphasize to these Jewish Christians that they should not do that. Don't leave Jesus. Don't abandon your faith in Jesus. Stay true to the gospel of, 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 of Jesus Christ. That's the main message of the book of Hebrews, and that can really be summed up by saying that, that the purpose of this book is to, is to really try to emphasize and reiterate to, to, to these Christians that Jesus is far more superior than anything else under the old law. Jesus is far more superior to what you had under the Old Testament System. When you study this book, the, the, the Hebrew writer really spends a great deal giving some, some very specific examples as to why Jesus is superior. He makes the point that Jesus is superior to, to the Old Testament prophets, and he's superior to angels, and he's superior to Moses, and he has a superior priesthood and covenant and sanctuary and sacrifice. The point of this book is to really emphasize the superiority of Jesus Christ. Don't abandon your faith in Jesus because what you have now in Jesus is far better than anything you had under the old covenant. And so that's the purpose of the book. And then some other things we need to understand about the background include this. First, we need to understand before we dive into this book that, that this can be a difficult book to, to really understand. This is one of the more meteor or one of the meteor books of, of the New Testament. Many compare this book actually to the book of Revelation in its difficulty. One of the things or one of the reasons why this book can be difficult to, to grasp and understand is because you really have to have a good understanding of the Old Testament to really be able to appreciate a lot of the things that are found in this book. This book points back to many of the things that are found under the Old Covenant, having a good understanding of the priesthood of the Old Covenant system and the tabernacle and the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices that God's people under the, under the Old Law were involved in. Having a good grasp of things like that are, are absolutely critical, I believe, to being able to really appreciate and, and grasp some of the things that are said in this book. And so this book can be very difficult if you don't have a good Old Testament background. And again, as I said before, the theme of this book is, is never abandon your faith in Christ, never abandon him. He's far better than anything under the Old Testament. And, and another thing that is really important to, to really see in this book is this book really emphasizes several times that it is possible for someone to abandon Jesus. It is possible for someone to give up their faith, 
to leave the truth, to go from being in a saved condition to being in a lost condition. This book clearly, clearly makes that point. For example, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we find a warning given to these Christians against drifting, drifting, leaving the Lord. In chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, we find a warning against departing from the Lord. In chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, we see that there's a warning there against being disobedient to the Lord. There the Hebrew writer mentions the people of Israel in the Old Testament and how as they were traveling uh, to the promised land, to the land that flowed with milk and honey in the days of Moses, because they disobeyed God, because they rebelled against his will, the Hebrew writer says that they did not enter their rest, that there's a reference to the fact that that generation did not enter into the promised land. They did not enter into their rest from God. And likewise, the point he's making is if we're not diligent to be obedient to God, we too can miss our rest. We too can miss our rest that is awaiting for us in heaven. And so in chapter 4, there's a warning against disobedience. And then in chapters 5 and 6, there are warnings against dullness of hearing. In other words, there can come to a point to, to where we no longer want to hear the truth. We close our ears to the truth. We harden our hearts against the truth. That can happen to Christians. And then you go to chapter 10 in verses 26 through 39, there the Hebrew writer says that as Christians, we can actually despise the grace of God. We can actually reject God's grace. We can actually refuse to receive the grace of God that we did at one time receive when we were immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. So here, several times throughout this book, at least seven or eight times, the Hebrew writer warns Christians that you can leave the truth. You can go from being in a saved condition to being in a lost condition if you don't remain faithful to God. And I got to tell you that, that that teaching the Hebrew writer gives is a huge problem for Calvinists. It is a huge problem for those who say that once you get saved, there's no way you can give up your salvation. There's no way you can go to be in a lost spiritual state once you become a follower of Jesus. The book of Hebrews totally blows that doctrine out of the water. And so those are some things I think we need to understand as far as the background of this book. But now let's dive into chapter 1. Let me just give you a, a brief overview that hopefully will help you as you study this at home with your family. Let me give you a brief overview of what we learn in Hebrews chapter 1. And allow me to begin by just reading the first three verses. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. Notice what the Bible says. It says, God. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, in many portions and in many ways in these last days... And these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir to all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Do you see the point? Do you see the point that the Hebrew writer is making as he opens this book, as he opens and, and begins his case to convince these Christians to hang on to their faith in Jesus? Do you see the point that he's making? Notice how the Hebrew writer begins this book. He begins making his case. But by emphasizing how Jesus, you need to stay faithful to Jesus because he is far better, he is a far more superior spokesman than the Old Testament prophets. He is far better, he's a far better spokesman than the Old Testament prophets. That's the point he's making in, in, in the first three verses. Notice how he begins in verse 1 by talking about how in past times, how in the time of the Old Covenant, God spoke to people in a variety of different ways, and, and we know that, don't we? 
We know that from Genesis to the book of Malachi, we can read about God communicating with men and women in a variety of different ways. For example, there are times in the Old Testament when God spoke to men through dreams. Remember in Daniel chapter 4, we, we find God communicating with Nebuchadnezzar through a dream. He communicated with Joseph through dreams. He also communicated to men through visions. And he also communicated to men through, through, through angels. We can read about God speaking to men through angels. And there are also times when God spoke to men directly. Remember, the children of Israel actually heard the very voice of God when they were at Mount Sinai. And then there were other times when God, in fact, the majority of times, God spoke to men through prophets. God spoke to, to men through messengers that he himself would communicate to, and they would then go and relay that message to whomever God told them to. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, Daniel, Micah, Hosea, Joel, Samuel, David. I mean, the list goes on and on. Throughout the Old Testament, we find so many instances where God communicated to people through his prophets. And unfortunately, most of the time when the prophets spoke, they were rejected. Jeremiah was rejected. Elijah was rejected. Several of the Old Testament prophets, when they went and spoke on the behalf of God, the people didn't like the things that they said, and, and they rejected them. And, and in some cases, they even, they even killed them. But God spoke to people through, through prophets. And the point that the Hebrew writer is making here is that Jesus is a far better spokesman than the Old Testament prophets. As great as Isaiah was, as great as Daniel and Joel and Micah were, Jesus is a far better spokesman than them. Jesus is a far better prophet because he's not just a prophet, but, but he is the prophet. He is God's chief messenger. He is the one who's always been with God. He is the creator. And when he came and spoke to men, they were hearing from the very voice of God. Jesus is a far better, better spokesman than, than the Old Testament prophets. Why? Because when Jesus spoke, he gave complete revelation from God. When Jesus spoke, he was speaking as God. He was speaking as the creator. Again, when people heard Jesus, they were hearing revelation that came directly from the very mouth of God. And so the Hebrew writer begins by making the point that even though God spoke in past times in a variety of different ways, now in these last days, he's speaking to us through Jesus. He's speaking to us through his chief spokesman, the very son of God. Now, I do want to say some things about this language in these last days. There's that language in these last days. Remember, we talked about that in our last video. Peter used that, lang that same language in 2 Peter 3 when he says in these last days, there were going to be people who mocked the return of Je Jesus and the destruction of the world. So the Hebrew writer says in these last days, God is speaking through Jesus. What are the last days? Well, well again, the, the last days, as we said in our previous video, the last days represent the last dispensation, the last covenant, the last, the, the last testament, the last dispensation of time, and that is the times we are living in today, Today, under the new covenant, God in the last days is speaking to us through his son. He's not speaking to us through prophets anymore. He's not speaking to us through dreams and through visions and through angels. No, today in these last days under the, 
last covenant, the last testament under the gospel dispensation, God is speaking to us through his son. Someone says, how is God speaking to us through his son? Well, every time we, we read our Bibles, every time we read the New Testament, we're reading from, from Jesus. We're reading the revelation that he has given. This is how God is speaking to us in the last days through the revelation of Jesus, through the gospel of Jesus. That's how God is speaking to us today. And so the Hebrew writer wants these Christians to understand that you have a far better spokesman now under the new covenant because the spokesman now is God himself. He's given complete revelation and when we listen to him, we can know and be everything God wants us to be. No longer is mankind receiving bits and pieces or partial revelation. We have the complete revelation when we listen to Jesus. And then you go to verse 3 to really emphasize his point. The Hebrew writer talks about the majesty of Jesus to really emphasize the point that Jesus is a superior spokesman. In verse 3, he talks about the glory of Jesus. Notice again, he talks about how Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation of God's nature. In other words, when people saw Jesus, they saw God. They saw what God is all about. Jesus' glory is described in verse 3. Also, the fact that, that he is the sustainer, that's described in verse, th in verse 3. It talks about how Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. In other words, the, the only reason why planet Earth is still standing, the only reason why we were able to wake up this morning and live our lives is because of Jesus. Jesus is the one who sustains all things. And then he also talks about the sacrifice of Jesus in verse 3. He talks about how Jesus, unlike Moses and unlike Isaiah and Daniel and those other prophets of the Old Testament, Jesus made purification for our sins. He died on a cross and provided an avenue for us to go to heaven. And then he talks about how Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God, unlike, unlike Micah and Joel and Habakkuk and Jeremiah. After Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he was exalted. He was exalted to the right hand of God. No one has been exalted like Jesus. And so the first three verses talk about how Jesus is a far better spokesman than the prophets of the Old Testament. And then beginning in verse number four and going through the rest of the chapter, the Hebrew writer is going to make the point that not only is Jesus superior to the Old Testament prophets, but he's also superior to, to angels. He, he's superior to, to angels. Look at verse number, number four, Hebrews 1 and verse 4. It says that having become, and he's still talking about Jesus, having become as much better than angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Here, the Hebrew writer transitions now, and he talks about angels. He says that Jesus is even better than angels. I'm going to tell you, that's a big statement. That is a huge statement being made by the Hebrew writer, because when we study our Bibles, we see from Genesis to Revelation that angels are great. Angels are mighty. Angels are special servants of God. They're spokesmen for God. They're powerful. They're majestic. They're spiritual. They are great beings, but the Hebrew writer says that Jesus is even better than the angels. The angels that the Jewish people certainly had a lot of fear and respect for. And why is Jesus more superior than angels? Well, beginning in verse number five and going through the rest of the chapter, he, he, he gives some very specific reasons why. In verse number five, he says that Jesus is more superior to angels because Jesus is God's son. He is the very son of of God. Look at verse 5. It says, For to which of the angels did he, referring to God the Father, to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have begotten you, and again I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. To which of the angels 
did God ever speak in this way to? Which of the angels came into the world as the very son of God? Which of the angels has actually been in the bosom of God the Father from eternity? Jesus is more superior than the angels because he's the very son of God. And then in verse number six, it says that he is more superior to the angels because unlike angels, Jesus is to be worshipped. In verse 6, it says, and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, the firstborn is the idea of, of the preeminent one. Jesus it has preeminence over all things. That's how the term firstborn is being used here to talk about preeminence. To, 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 when it says, again, he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels, let all the angels of God worship him. Notice how angels in heaven worship Jesus. They worship Jesus. Jesus doesn't worship angels, but they worship him. And likewise, we're also supposed to worship him. We're not supposed to worship angels, but we're supposed to worship Jesus. It reminds me what we find in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 22, towards the end of the book of Revelation, the apostle John wrote these words, Revelation 22 and verse 8, he says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Notice how here we find John trying to worship an angel. But he, referring to the angel, said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. Notice how only God is to be worshipped, not angels, and Jesus is God. Jesus is worthy of worship. In fact, several times throughout Jesus' ministry, we find people bowing down and worshiping Jesus, and he never stops them. He never prohibits them from doing that like the angel did in Revelation 22. And so Jesus is superior to angels because he's the son of God, and because he's worthy of worship, but then thirdly, he's also su superior to angels because he is God, because he's deity. That's the point he makes in verses 8 through 9. Hebrews 1 and verse 8, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God. Now this is, in the context here, this is actually God the Father speaking to Jesus. God the Father speaking of Jesus. Notice what God the Father said of Jesus. He said, your throne, O God. God the Father called Jesus, O God. It's forever and ever. And the righteousness, righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, again, this is God the Father referring to Jesus or speaking to Jesus. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Notice how here the Hebrew writer is making the point that unlike angels, Jesus is God. He is deity. He is of the same nature as God the Father. And then in verses 10 through 12, he says that Jesus is far superior to angels because he's the creator. He's the creator of all things. Verse 10, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Again, this is a reference to Jesus. Jesus is the Lord in the context here, who in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens or the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain they all will become old like a garment and like a mantle. You will roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same and your years will not come to an end. All of that, my dear friends, all of that is talking about Jesus. The Hebrew writer is saying that angels are great, but they're nothing compared to Jesus because he is God and he is the creator. He was the one who made all things in the beginning. And then there's one more reason why Jesus is superior to angels in this chapter. And that is because Jesus, unlike angels, Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God. Verse 13. 
But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? To which of the angels has God ever said that? To which of the angels has God ever exalted so high to where he is at his very right hand? The whole point of that section is emphasizing the superiority of Jesus in comparison to angels. Angels were great. They were highly respected to the Jewish people, but they're nothing to Jesus. Jesus is far greater than angels because he is the son of God, because he's worthy of worship, because he is God, because he is the creator, because he has been exalted to the right hand of God. Here the Hebrew writer gives five reasons as to why Jesus is far better than angels. And then, as we move on to one more verse here, verse 14, after talking about how Jesus is superior in name, power, and exaltation, in verse, in verse 14, it, it appears that the Hebrew writer still wants to make the point that, yes, Jesus is far better than angels, but, but angels are, are still great, okay? Notice what he says in verse 14, and then we'll conclude our video. In verse 14, in talking about angels, even though they have not been exalted to the right hand of God, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation? Three things I want you to notice about angels here in this verse. First, I want you to notice how the Hebrew writer describes angels. While they are not God, deity, and worthy of worship, they are ministering spirits. They are spirits who minister. They're spirits who serve. They fulfill the purposes of God. In fact, I want you to notice, secondly, how he specifically says here how angels minister to those who inherit salvation. Who are those who inherit salvation? That's me. That's you. That's anyone who's a Christian, anyone who has been immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins and been added to the Lord's kingdom. The Hebrew writer says that angels have the purpose of ministering to us as God's people, even though we can't see them, the Bible says they are ministering to us. And then thirdly, someone says, well, how do they do this? Well, my friend, I don't know how they do this. I don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. I don't know how angels are working in my life and in your life every single day. All I know is that they're doing something. They're doing what these verses say, and I'm okay with that. I trust God. I trust that there are ministering spirits out there helping us and serving us every day in ways that we are unaware. I, I trust that because the Bible says so. And so angels are helping God's people. That's chapter 1. In chapter 1, the point of the text is Jesus is superior. He's superior to the Old Testament prophets, and he's superior to angels. That's the first two things the Hebrew writer talks about in this book, and he's going to talk about a lot of other reasons as to why Jesus and his gospel and his covenant are far more superior than anything that was found under the old law. We're going to be talking about that over the next few weeks. I hope this video will help you in your study of chapter 1. Again, get a copy of the outline. Uh, be looking for our next video that should be coming out on Sunday morning on Hebrews 2. But thank you for watching, and I hope you uh, have a blessed day.